Hi, this is Marilyn Gigliotti, Veronica from Clerks, and you're listening to Cynic Radio Podcast. You're listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Now, your hosts, Igri and Cynic. And you are listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast, and I'm your host, Cynic, and joining me as always, my co-host, and two men who have never knocked a body out of a casket out of weight, Igri and Ryan. And on this week's show, we get the chance to review Kevin Smith's masterpiece, Clerks. We also get the honor of sitting down and interviewing Ms. Marilyn Gigliotti, who owned the screen as Veronica in that movie. Because we are the Cynic Radio Podcast. Like, listen, subscribe. Most importantly, don't try this at home. Well, folks, what can I say about our first guest tonight? For me, it doesn't come any bigger. I won't lie. I've been fanboying it up ever since she agreed to come on the show. The first lady of clerkdom, Ms. Marilyn Gigliotti, joins the program. Oh, you got it. You got it. (laughs) Thank you. I I was just telling IG, I said, if I can get her last name right, everything's going to go golden. (laughs) So, Marilyn, it's a pleasure to have you. And how are you? And thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Um, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, first day off in a, in a while, and I spent it cleaning my kitchen. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. I definitely know I need to clean mine. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning for you. You were uh-huh. extremely introverted as a child, even shy, yes. afraid to talk in class. What drew yes. you to acting? I don't know that it necessarily something drew me to it or... Or it just kind of found me, as I say. It was at a point that I was looking for something in my life. It, it, the best I can say is, like, it found me. Um, and then once I, after training for a couple of years, I got on that stage for the first time. And people were actually listening to what I had to say. Uh, you know, I, I was hooked pretty much from there. And then, and then also the fact that um, you kind of get to be someone who is not you. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a way that, you know, when, when you're shy about something, but, but you're, you're, you're getting to play a character that is not shy, that is very outgoing and, and just, you, it's like you have the license to be able to do certain things without being judged no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, did you have a background in stand-up or theater before you translated into film? I, I did community theater, um, and along with Brian, as a matter of fact. Um, we did a couple of shows together, and, and my first time going to the community theater area, I saw Brian on stage, and he was playing Renfield in Dracula, and... He pretty much stole the show. Um, he was fabulous. And then to have found myself working with him on a couple of other stage productions, it was really nice. And, and then to have this history with him is amazing. Yeah, he's a great guy. I've met him a couple times in person. I've been trying to get him on the show forever. I really <laughs> think that he is one of the most underrated actors out there. I mean, not only just his portrayal of Dante, but everything else that he's done, I've been a huge fan of. I, I mean, Brian, Brian's got chops, and I think yeah. that the mainstream world needs to realize that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, but, you know, unfortunately, I've gotten to know so many talented people in this business, especially since moving to L.A., and unfortunately, talent is not necessarily what gets you known so your first big break came in your early 30s what was the casting process like and your reaction to being cast as veronica for clerks uh at the time that i went to audition for clerks it basically was coming out of i'd done already i've done community theater so now we hear that there was auditions for a film going on at uh, one of the theaters that we worked at. And so basically it was going there, just taking a chance, seeing, okay, can I do this for film? And um, then having Kevin call me up to come and read the script, make sure I was comfortable with what I was had, having to say. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just been kind of a nice ride so far, so, so to speak. 
for me, getting any kind of major role, it's always scary because of having to memorize all those lines. Uh, so and that's, that's the one thing. And, and uh, memorizing anything is, is always difficult. Well, at that point, you had very limited work on film. You get Veronica, which is kind of a meaty part with a fair yeah. amount of dialogue. Were you nervous yeah. going into it? And do you have a process where you learn to kind of memorize your lines? Um, well, at this point, yeah, I have a, I, you know, I have a process. And basically, it's when I'm not memorizing those lines, I'm thinking about the character, thinking about the backstory, thinking about everything that has to do with that character, which then helps me memorize the, those lines. But, but even back then, though, it's like getting when, when you're doing theater, there's a lot of lines in that. But we have about two weeks process of blocking and going over the lines and going over the play. So it helps to memorize those lines. When when it comes to film, you get the role and you are by yourself until you know you, you're told when it is that they're going to be shooting. And there there is no rehearsal process. The rehearsal process is actually the blocking for camera on set. Gotcha. So you're on your own to learn your lines. Do you have a scene partner or a study buddy that you work with? Sometimes you can get together with the other actors and that helps. Um, but that's not always feasible because, you know, um, sometimes we have other things going on or we have our day jobs to go to and, and things like that. So, you know, you do the best that you can. But there is one little thing that I do have that also helps and it's it's an app that's called Rehearsal Pro made by another actor, David H. Lawrence, the 18th. <laughs> you can basically record your lines and leave space for the other person or record the other, you know, if you want to, in another voice so that this way you kind of have something to kind of go along with. Yeah, that sounds like it's a lot of work too. I mean, I, I know I've memorized things for different things in my past and it's always kind of problematic just and especially when it doesn't when there's no real reference until you're actually in it i guess so what was it like being set in kevin's first big project what was it like on set did you have any idea that this movie or even kevin smith himself would gain such a cult-like status no i mean you know when we're on set the first thing was, okay, I want to get the lines right because we don't have a lot of footage uh, or a lot of film to be able to do a lot of takes. And then the one thing that I always say is like, we were all in the same boat, meaning it was like, we had no film experience whatsoever. Uh, so we were just doing our best to give Kevin what he wanted. And I'm sure Kevin was doing his best to get what he wanted as well. Uh, to be able to communicate to us, which he did well, to be able to get what he wants. So, and I say this to everybody, I don't think you can ever know what your film is going to do. I mean, many times out here in L.A., you've got a lot of people who are looking for actors and they'll post them on Actors Access or or other submission sites and say it's especially in the very beginning when they're doing this it's like you know they're trying to get actors to just give their time and not be paid and it's like oh you're going to be working on this great great project and you'll get experience and you'll get your copy and credit afterwards well not always you don't always get your copy of the film to be able to put on your resume or, or on your reel and not too many people are, I think, well aware of whether their piece is good or not. <laughs> just like just like when you watch American Idol and you've got some of these people who audition and are not well aware of whether they can really sing or not. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, they have no clue, and uh, then they're just subject of mockery, and they go down an internet lore. I mean, YouTube is the worst for that, the, the clips of just bad singers and people going out the wrong door. On set, was there anyone not really acting and more like their character, they were basically playing themselves, or was everybody basically sticking to role and uh, they were all just lines Kevin, uh, Kevin wrote? Oh, our, 
Well, are you asking whether we were able to improvise? Well, were you able to improvise, and who is the most like their character? We were not allowed to improvise. We stuck to script. And as far as who's... Gosh, um, I, you know, I, I'd have to say that everybody has some similarities to their characters, although I wouldn't say that Brian is like Dante as far as, like, the whiner. <laughs> um or that he doesn't have ambition or anything like that. Um, I, I mean, I find a lot of similarities with Veronica in the sense of, you know, trying to be there for her man, as, you, as she says, and just trying to make him realize that, or whoever that significant other is, make them realize that, you know, they are, they can be better, that they can be somebody and that, they can do better. Um, and, well, Jason, well, it was written about him, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say Muse had to be the one that it was pretty much yeah. just like their their character there. Either yeah. that or the Tuli's gum representative, one or the, one or the other. Yeah. But Muse, I, I had to get that Muse was is just like that. I mean, I've even seen him on some of the, the just kind of stage shows that Kevin has put on where he and – Muse and other people go out and take questions from the audience and tell stories and oh, yeah. Muse is kind of like that everywhere else too. So oh yeah, <laughs> most definitely. So uh, you were in sh- on shirts, you were on posters. I mean, you your face was plastered everywhere for a while, and you're got to be about one of the biggest stars in your home state of New Jersey at the time. Was that a bit surreal? I actually, I will say that I wasn't one of the biggest stars back in Jersey, in my town, because my town alone, Bon Jovi came from there, uh, Dave Sabo from Skid Row came from there, Greg Evigan from uh, DJ and the Bandit, so, and I think a few others that I'm not aware of, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm low on the totem pole there. <laughs> so what do they put the water in your town? Oh my lord, did get that many people? <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? I, 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 you know, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what, why that is. But there's, I mean, if, if you look at it though, there's a lot of famous people that do come from Jersey. But you still kind of came from relative unknown to your face yeah. plastered all over T-shirts and and posters and everything else. That had to kind of give you some kind of different feeling about yourself. Yeah, you know, it didn't. It didn't. Only because still had to prove myself and, and you know once clerks was was done then i kind of had to try and match that try to get something else and try to capitalize on that and and that didn't really happen well not right away but it seems like as of re- late things are really taking off for you i know i'm from new jersey myself and i mean that red bank leonardo area it's those movies are kind of folklore now. You guys are all heroes yeah. in that area, even today. <laughs> I mean, they're all still standing outside the quick check, posing for photos, and inside, if they're lucky enough to to kind of kiss up to the clerk a little bit. So, <laughs> I, I mean, in that part, I mean, there might have been people that were bigger stars as far as the 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 country or the world as a whole, but it, as far as that area, you guys, it didn't get much bigger than you know you and Brian and Kevin and and Jason for that period of time. Yeah, so, definitely. No, it, it definitely was a was a great time. But again, you know, it, it was, you know, so new to the film industry because we had come from the, the theater. We didn't we just didn't know what to do from there to to be able to kind of, you know, keep going. So with age comes wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Put, putting yourself in Dante's shoes right now. Who would have you chosen, <laughs> Veronica or Caitlin? Oh, my gosh. Putting myself in Dante's shoes? Yeah. Oh. Uh. <laughs> this has got to be easier than that. You got to go Veronica for sure, right? Well, well, I you, would you, say. you make lasagna, all the things that you did. I mean, come on. I think I even saw her change his tire once. <laughs> I mean, definitely, yes, Veronica. I mean, but... You don't know whether he actually would have done that or, I mean, he did. He actually did go back to her and say, I, I love you and, and all that kind of stuff. But, and she was basically like, fuck you. Mm-hmm. Had Jay and Silent Bob not gone into the convenience store to kind of impose their wisdom, 
<laughs> you know, you don't know if that would have actually happened and changed in that respect, and 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 if he would have gone further. Also, if if uh, Caitlin hadn't, you know, screwed the dead guy in the bathroom. <laughs> well, we've all been there. I mean, that's as that's happened to everyone <laughs> once in a while. Those guys weren't dead, Ig. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so have you ever been in a Dante Caitlin type relationship where you knew it was bad for you, but you just couldn't seem to shake it? Uh, yeah, I was in a very bad relationship and, and you go into it and it's like, everything's all great. And all of a sudden it's like, you start seeing these signs, but nothing concrete. And you know, th then when it goes bad, it goes bad real hard and real fast and real bad. You can only, Use it as, as experience. Just you know, shake yourself off and get up and and go on. And well, yeah. hopefully come, not come out of the end better. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and 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 try not to let it, you know, sway you in 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 any way on any future relationships as well. Don't bring the baggage. Well, background yeah. checks work perfectly for that as well. I mean, check credit yes. scores, criminal histories, STD screenings, anything you can to get an advantage in today's dating world. Definitely, now, Marilyn. An ongoing joke of the film was Veronica's lucky number 37, fortunately not in a row. <laughs> Have you been given a hard time over the years about Veronica's very giving nature? Well, you know, sometimes it can be a little over the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> and other times it can be very fun loving. Uh, it's just, you know, guys needing to realize when is it over the line and over the top. <laughs> Well, and that's really a problem these days where people don't know how to draw the line between real and, and fake, and then you end up with a president like that. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it definitely is a problem where people can't distinguish that, uh, you know, perfect example, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan from The Walking Dead living in a regular community out in the middle of New York, and people decide, well, it's not gated. He doesn't have security, so let's go knock on his door because everybody yeah. wants to talk with Negan. Not a great idea. No, not at all. I you know, and I, I, you know, I will try to make fun of it first. <laughs> I will say that. And I have no problem with making fun of it and, 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 and the 37 and all that. Um, but again, you know, it's just like people just need to kind of realize they need to, they need to kind of run it and say it out loud before they say it out loud to me so that they can realize. <laughs> Yeah, they, they speak before they think, and that, that's <laughs> problematic all the time. I mean, yeah. no matter where you are in life, I have to think before I speak to my wife because I don't want things <laughs> to come out wrong to her. <laughs> you know, I'm certainly not going to walk up to somebody who just because I saw him in a movie, now I think we're best friends and just really give it to him. That just always seems like a bad idea, and I know that there's a fair amount of them that bring security with them. So I don't want to go to one of these places that I paid to go to get my butt kicked on top of it. Right, right. So Kevin Smith, you know, tends to recast a lot of the actors over and over in a lot of his films. Were mm -hmm. you ever tempted to dive back into the VSQ waters? Oh, of course, always. Um, <laughs> and here's 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 a funny little thing, because I was asked to be in Chasing Amy um, to play Joey Lauren again uh, across from Joey Lauren Adams uh, as her girlfriend. And one way that I kind of put it to her when I finally met her a couple of years ago, she's like, well, why didn't you? And it's like, I was, a f and I didn't know what I was going to say to her, but I said, it's like, I was afraid of challenges at that time, um, which is true. Come to realize, I don't know how long after, but it was when I already moved to LA uh, that the reason I had never been asked again was because I had turned down that role. Well, I was thinking that it was Kevin. I come to find out it wasn't Kevin at all. It was Harvey Weinstein. Well, maybe the door's back open again because uh, they're <laughs> going to put him in a hole somewhere. Let's hope. <laughs> well, I, I was, um, you know, if Clerks 3 had happened, I was supposed to be in that as well. So, I mean, you know, I would have been coming back to the VSQ family. But, yeah, I mean, it would be nice if, if you know, I, I could be in some other stuff. So... Well, you know, you just never, you just never know, though. <clears throat> There's always a chance that uh, Kevin talks Jeff down out of the mountains. But speaking <laughs> of the mountains, you moved from you grew up in New Jersey, and then you relocated yeah. to pursue your career around 1998. What's the biggest uh -huh. difference between living on the East Coast, like you did most of your life, and out on the West Coast now? Weather. 
<laughs> oh no. Uh, besides the weather, I mean, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I miss from Jersey. Obviously, um, can't get great Chinese food or pizza and things like that. But you know, some of that I can't even have anymore. Here's the one thing: it's been really hard to feel that suburban feeling out here that you get back east, especially in New Jersey. There, there's, there's been some cities like Burbank that have come close to it, but there is just nothing like that suburban feeling of neighborhood uh, that you get back east. You don't really get it here. That makes sense. Also, an accomplished makeup artist. Yes. What's your biggest piece of advice to like struggling actors have a trade to fall back on? Absolutely, especially out here. When I first moved out here, I so I was working in a salon back in New Jersey, and so I filled out all the paperwork that I needed to fill out so that I can get my uh, license, cosmetology license, out here in L.A. But once I actually got here and that finally came in the mail, they wanted me to do 60 hours worth of schooling. But then I couldn't find anybody who would take me for just 60 hours worth of schooling because it was, and it was basically for um, the rules and regulations because they're, they differ from state to state. So for a while there, I, I didn't have a license, uh, a cosmetology license here. So I could not work in a salon as a stylist. I worked in a salon for quite a while as a, as a receptionist and basically slash manager, even though I didn't get manager's pay. But I also worked in an office because I had office experience. Um, and out here, you have to be kind of a jack of all trades to be able to survive here. It's not as easy to find a job. That was, that was especially one thing. It's like, I moved out here thinking, oh, no problem. I can find a job anywhere. Oh, that is so not the case. And so anytime I ever have anybody kind of contact me asking me advice, on moving out here to LA, I always tell them, try to line up a job before you come out here, make sure you have enough money. And it's not that easy. The first year is going to be tough. The first six months, even tougher. Having the trade is even better than waiting tables, I would guess, even if you're doing the receptionist and everything else. Still got to be better than waiting tables. Sure. I mean, but I, you know, I, I hand it to, uh, to people who do wait tables because it's not something that I'd be able to do. I could not carry all the things that they have to carry, memorize everything that they have to memorize. You know, that's a tough job. It really is a tough job, but it it really doesn't matter what kind of trade you have. There's a million people out here all looking for the same thing. And whether they're in the industry business or not, there are people coming into this city all the time looking for jobs and jobs are still tough to get anywhere. Well, like you said, being cast is about who you know. It's it pretty much getting hired any place anymore is about who you know. You have to have a relative or somebody you know already working in that establishment or just an overwhelming resume to get considered for any kind of job anymore. When I finally um, was able to get my cosmetology license out here, I went looking for a job. And I had my resume all set up because I had already also worked in the business as far as uh, – working on film sets, doing hair and makeup and, and, and other aspects as well. And so I went to some salons and I showed them my resume and they loved it. And they would have hired me on the spot if I had a clientele, but I hadn't been working in a salon. So I didn't have a clientele. So I never got a job. I, it took me quite a while to finally find a, a salon that would take me without a clientele. Cause a lot of these salons that I was even going in, it's like, there was nobody in there except maybe one or two people, one of them at the desk, waiting for whoever to walk through that door, and the other one working on her small clientele. You know, there's a, there's a lot of salons out here, and just like there's a lot of Starbucks, a lot of 7-Elevens, and, you know, it's just on every block almost. Well, I know I was out there a couple months ago, and it, everywhere we went, I was trying to keep an eagle eye no matter where we went into, no matter how big or small the store was or or Starbucks, because you never know who you're going to see behind the counter waiting for their big break. Yeah. So th- that's <laughs> kind of fun, too, because usually you just play spot the star in the air, in the airport, but there you, you get to do it all over the place, walking through Disney, the guy under the Mickey suit, just about anywhere. 
Now, Marilyn, yeah. part of the reason we're talking today is because I found you on social media. With smaller studios being swallowed up by the bigger ones, how big of a part is social media now in not only funding indie films, but promoting them as well? Oh, my gosh. Well, <clears throat> social media just even plays a big, huge part in getting cast because the studios or the production companies like whoever they're going to cast to have a big social media following. Um, so if you have anything under 50K, you're almost not considered. So that's the reason why you probably haven't seen me because I don't have anywhere near <laughs> near 10. So. We'll try to get you at least five followers by the end of the week. We'll, we'll do our best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, it really does play such a huge part. But the other thing that I've been finding out as well is you've got a lot of studios that you, they're looking for content, but they want you to have the content already filmed, but you need the money to be able to film the content. So <laughs> you kind of run into these circles of, you know, trying to, to figure out the catch 22 of it all. Right now, I have I've gotten together with a group of other filmmakers, and we're creating our own content. And so, uh, about uh, well, this tomorrow it'll be four weeks now that we launched our Indiegogo campaign, um, and we're doing a series of short films. So you know, I mean, it's going slow, but I'm very overwhelmed by some of the people that I know contributing to it. So that's always a nice thing. So my understanding is you're kind of involved in a newer thing that's coming up about the shooting of clerks called coincidentally shooting clerks. I am. Uh, so since you're not only in it, you're also portrayed by someone else in it and you're a producer on it. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, it's kind of scary to have somebody portraying me. I've not seen the film and they've shown it quite a few times um, we were at WonderCon in the spring, and they showed a couple of clips of mine. So I was like, okay, I I, I did pretty good. It's like, I, you know, because I'm my worst enemy when it comes to criticizing my work. Um, so I, I was happy with what I did with what was shown. But again, it's like I've not seen the film in its entirety and so it's a bit scary to kind of, when I do see it, to experience somebody else wearing my face. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be at San Diego Comic-Con this week, this coming week. Uh, we have a panel on Thursday evening from 6.45 to 7.45 in room 6A. And then I was able to uh, juggle a table for Friday morning from 10 to 12 so that hopefully we get to meet some fans and and sign some autographs. Oh, that would be an amazing opportunity. I'm a big con junkie. And to see anybody from clerks out there signing signatures, I would definitely be in line for that if I was in the San Diego area. Getting our fan base more familiar with you, if not clerks, could you recommend one project that you're involved in that you would want everyone to see? Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, so I've worked with this writer-director uh, on several of his films, Neil Johnson. And the latest one that is out is called Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter, which I, I feel is one of his best films. Um, I've just recently worked on another film. It's called Evolution War. I believe that's going to be coming out later this year. And uh, I do some voice work on that one as a medbot. Uh, <laughs> but I always love working with him. Um, because he, he, he really gives me some excellent things to work on and challenging roles. And, and they're always, they, you know, they may not be huge roles, but they're always pivotal roles to the story. Yeah. So your IMDb page has been a hotbed of activity lately with a lot of huge projects in the works like Laidover and Evolution War. They're all on the horizon. What can you tell us about these? I'm sure to be... Pretty epic films. Well, Laid Over is a short film directed by Tom Proctor, his directorial debut. The, the, the piece itself is the, the, the lead actress, Mo Kelly, 
This is a story that she told Tom Proctor, and he just thought that it was such a great story that he recorded it and had someone put it into a script form. Um, and to her, this piece is not a comedy, but it is a comedy. And it's just something that she experienced in her life that to her was just something very, very serious. But when you just kind of put it all into perspective, it's just a very funny thing. And we, we shot this up in Utah, St. George, Utah, and um, at an airport, no less. And we got footage that nobody else would be able to get what we got as far as like planes landing, <laughs> um, people getting off the plane. So it, it, that was really kind of phenomenal to be able to do. Um, and I play this really hysterical uh, ticket agent. I, I just can't really say much more than that. <laughs> um, and as far as Evolution War, unfortunately, I don't know the story. Only what, what it says on IMDb, because I wasn't really given the whole script. I was only given what I needed to voice my character. That makes sense, but the difference between having to show up set on set and show up on a soundstage and just do voiceover work has got to be great, right? Because you can come in a hot mess, go through your whole day of work, and go home and never have to put your makeup on. Well, it wasn't really a soundstage. It was more like a bedroom. <laughs> gotcha. Even um, better. In, in, yeah. in a house. Uh, yeah, you know, it's like, um, so, because Neil pretty much, he shoots what what is available, with what is available, I should say. Um, and, and I myself, I, in the corner of my hallway, I've got a computer with a microphone set up so that whenever I have, if I have to do any kind of voiceover, I just do it right in there. Um, and in my living room, I've got it set up. So if I need to do self taping, because that's the big thing nowadays is doing self tapes, I get it done in here. So there's no really need to go to a sound stage anymore to do a lot of things. Yeah, the technology has gotten so great that you can do most things at home. I mean, hell, most movies are being edited on people's home PC anymore. So Exactly. You know, the, the do-it-yourselfer film campaigns are absolutely great. So, Marilyn, where can our listeners find you on social media? And let's talk about that GoFundMe campaign. So I am on Instagram, Marilyn Gigliotti, as well as Facebook, Marilyn Gigliotti fan, fan page. And Twitter, it's that clerk's girl. In fact, uh, as far as the Indiegogo, when I came back from Utah, because I, in my mind, for many years, have been wanting to direct. I had a short film idea, but I never did it because as easy <clears throat> as it is to film these days, you still need money. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I did not want to do is have people work on my film if they weren't going to get paid. I wanted to pay them. E even if it wasn't, you know, what they're worth and only the minimum as per SAG, I still wanted to pay the people that were going to help me with whatever project. And I so did not, I repeat, did not want to do crowdfunding. <laughs> I didn't want to beg for money. <laughs> But ultimately, once I got back from Utah and I said to myself, I, you know, I have to, I have to do this. I have to figure it out to make it happen. I'm going to have to beg for money, unfortunately. So I, I was two weeks into getting all my people together and figuring out my budget and what I was going to be doing and how I was going to be doing it and what I needed when all of a sudden uh, these other filmmakers came to me uh, saying it's like we're doing this series of short films would love to have a meeting with you they asked me it to come on board to be in two of the short stories but to also come on as producer and that they were looking to do crowdfunding as well and i said to them well i just happened to kind of be doing the same thing and so they happily said bring yours on board and we'll do it all together and we'll put it add it to the mix and and it's it everything's just kind of really been falling right into place uh you know the money is not falling into place as quickly as i would like but <laughs> I, i'm hoping that happens you know i mean we we still are going to try to 
make this happen, you know, however way we can, if we have to do several crowdfundings. Um, and, but, you know, we're also looking for independent uh, uh, sources as well for funding. Going from actor to filmmaker, I mean, you uh-huh. show up at work, you say your lines, and you're part of the project, to becoming the project and having your hands in a little bit of everything. It's got to be a lot more challenging, but a lot more rewarding when the, the film is all done, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's still a lot of areas that I don't know, but because I've been in the business working in front and behind the scenes, whether I was, even if I was just doing makeup, I'm still watching what everybody does. It, it, it certainly helped. And when it comes to the areas that you don't know, you just seek those that you do know that do know those areas and, and, and have the expertise. I, I find it all very fulfilling and rewarding. Well, Marilyn, it's been our honor and our pleasure to have you, and we appreciate what time you carved out for us. I'll be looking for all your projects in the future, and I will definitely donate to your, your uh, independent GoFund thing. And Oh, thank you. We appreciate you so much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you guys, really, seriously. Thanks for being here. If you haven't had your head in the sand for the last 20 or 5 or so years, Dante and Randall are less than fulfilled with their McJobs. IG, what was your least favorite job of all time? Well, my least favorite job would probably be the first job I ever had. I was one of those cart pushing kids at Target. And this was well before the time when they had those nice little motorized things to help get the carts up into the store. Like it was all full manual labor. Um, my parking lot in, was uphill toward the store. Uh, I started working there in late fall. So about a week after I started there, it started snowing. And they just did not give a shit. They're like, go back out, get more carts. I'm like, this is full. Yeah, but there's carts out there in the lot. Go get them. There weren't even cart corrals at the time. So I guess if that tells you how old I am, it it was menial job for three eighty five an hour and no hope for any kind of improvement. It was pretty awful. Now, because of that job, IG, do you always return your cart to the cart corral? Or are you just like, screw it, these kids need to learn the way I did? I, I kind of, if I get a chance, I'll kick it all the way down to the end of the parking lot and just let it go. <laughs> Run over it with my car so make sure that it has that one bad wheel. Um, For me, I did a factory job for about three years, and uh, it was pretty bad. It was industrial base. I saw a lot of people get hurt. Uh, you had to have your blood tested because your lead count was so high that they could either take you out of service or make you wear a respirator 24-7. I mean, the money was good, but you were basically a human uh, science experiment. I was pretty sure if I stayed any longer that I would end up turning into the Hulk. So I got out of there and I kind of moved on to some other slightly less awful jobs until I ended up where I was now. How about you, Ryan? All right. I got it. Um, and mine is far, far le- but just tedious was that I was working for a nursing staffing company where I basically... My job was to, it was basically just data entry. So I just had to sit at a computer for eight hours a day and just enter in stuff from like index cards and from emails. And it was just tedious and boring and had zero social interaction. So I would say that was easily the the worst experience. It wasn't manual labor. It wasn't physically taxing. I wasn't at any kind of really health risk. It just was boring. Oh, man, it's got to be rough. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> we're over here, science experiments and trudging through the snow. And he's like, I had to sit at a desk with a computer and listen to music on my headphones exactly. while I type things yep. in all day. Listen, oh, man, my God. the risk for first world problems. <laughs> carpal tunnel is real, man. <laughs> IG, although the his vilification was a bit misplaced, did the Chulis gum representative make a pretty good anti-smoking argument. I mean, did he make you want to put down your cigarettes and maybe chew some Chulis gum? Uh, well, it almost seemed like communist in the way he was going about it. He's like he was standing up front and he just needed a soapbox to stand on. I mean, the the argument was might have been somewhat sound, but, you know, as was evident in the movie, as soon as he was found out to be a Chulis gum representative, everybody went back to buying cigarettes. So... Can't you have both? Can't you have gum and and cigarettes? You know, you could smoke the menthols and chew mint gum. You'd be minty fresh forever. Well, and what I loved about that, too, was after it did get broken up, I loved Brian O'Halloran's acting when uh, the guy asked for a pack of cigarettes. 
after he was being pelted by cigarettes, which in today's standards, I mean, he should have probably just picked those up because that was a lot of money laying on the ground, but just the indignant look. And his girlfriend, uh, Veronica, did make a great point. At least they weren't lit. How about you, Ryan? Did you like the cancer merchant speech or do you think people should be left to their own devices? It, it, was, a great, it was a great speech and I loved, I loved the kind of twist it, you know the twist that that he really was just the representative for the gum, but you know, I think it uh, you know not to bring reality to this situation of movie. Having dealt dealing with the health and wellness field, you can't convince people to stop smoking. You can you can give them a rah rah speech, and maybe for you know twenty minutes or a day, maybe they're they're convinced that they're going to stop. But I think people have to really want to quit. So I think no amount of um, kind of verbal persuasion is going to work until somebody really decides on their own that they want to quit. My grandfather used to tell a great story about how he would, he said he was going to quit smoking when cigarettes hit a quarter. So that, that just makes you, it makes you laugh because uh, when I worked at a convenience store for a short period of time, I was surprised when it was like 20 or $30 for a carton. And now it's just almost $20, $20 for a pack. It really has gotten out of hand and you, you would think that would cause people to stop, but it really doesn't. IG, although they might be drug dealers and profound loiters, what are your thoughts on Jay and Silent Bob, and would you hang out with them? Well, you know, Jay and Silent Bob are really just a unique set of characters that are kind of like a modern-day Laurel and Hardy, except that one of them doesn't really say anything, except for the one profound thing a movie, but they are just what seems like a blast to hang out with. They just always have something going on. Half of it's going to be directed at making fun of you, but the other half's going to be making fun of somebody else. So why not? Yeah. I mean, they, they seem like just a good time. And you know me, I'm always about the good time. <laughs> yes, yes, you are, which gets brought up several times in the press packet and the new website. Plug. <laughs> I love Jay and Silent Bob. I mean, they are the dynamic comedy duo of our generation and even though one doesn't say anything he's just as funny as jay just with his mannerisms and his reactions and i love that one section of movie every single time where he just comes out with something great i mean in uh, uh chasing amy it's about how he wanted to be a showgirl i absolutely uh, i love the chemistry between the two of them I mean, if, if you ever get the chance, definitely go see one of their, their shows. They do a couple different variations, but one is uh, Jay and Silent Bob Get Old, and I watched a couple on the internet, and Jason Mewes and Kevin Smith are magic together. Ryan, did Dante overreact to the snowball bombshell and Veronica's number of going down on 37 guys? I, yes, but I think it's the reaction that every guy would have had. And I loved, um, how, you know, I loved that scene because it, it really plays out the way I think – almost any guy would react to that, you know, that kind of, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, the complete hypocrisy um, and he really plays into it well. And it's beautiful as far as comedy, but also just in, in how honest it is. Well, you know, it, it lends credence to the fact that you should always let somebody else's past be their past. You know, it's, we've all had done things with people before that, you know, we probably wouldn't do with who we're with now because we maybe respect them just a tad more. You know, his only hope is that he's not 38 in the line of 100. If, just keep her around, do the right thing. But I mean, 37 and in what seems to be their mid 20s seems a little high. But, you know, she's obviously hasn't slept with that many because she said it was like four or something. So, you know, she'll blow a guy. You know, what's the big deal? Well, pre-HPV, it's a it's a high number, but I'm sure that he would want – you don't ask these questions of people if you don't want to hear the answer. That's that's my big thing is try never to ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. Be, and then you can't be mad at the answer. I mean, she got around a little bit. She was exploratory, but – you kind of have to blame yourself when something like that comes out. I mean, do you think there's a double standard between the reaction to guys' numbers, partners, compared to girls? Absolutely. I think we definitely live in a society where, um, you know, generally, if like if one of your guy friends says that they've you know been with 20, 30, 40 women, you know, they'll get high fives and, and you almost envy them. Where if a girlfriend says the same thing, you, you look down on them, and I think that's like a, that's kind of something that's kind of built into our society, and, and it's kind of been around for a long time, and it, and I think it's not fair, and it is hypocritical, um, but it is 
part of the world. And I think that was one of the great things about that scene and the way it plays out is that it really feeds into, you know, really kind of plays on that hypocrisy. It makes you really think, well, what what's the difference? And why do we kind of have this gut reaction one way when it comes from a woman versus another way when it comes from a guy. How about you, IG? Do you view a man's number and a woman's number in the same light? Well, you know, no, because men got to work for that stuff. Women just got to say, let's do it. <laughs> no, of course I view it in the same light. You know, it, you know, we all if we all want to be equal, then, then we all have to be equal. And it, it should just matter the same way. But, you know, truth be told, it doesn't matter what somebody's history is if they're with you now. If, if, they're, if they want to be with you, then they're with you. Who cares about what they did in the past? And really, if all things go well, even if their num- if their number was huge in the past, maybe that's really benefiting you into they're really good in bed because they know what they like. And that that's always a good thing, too, I think. Yeah, I think IG's uh, motto is at least Cynic wasn't 36 and Ryan's not going to be 38. <laughs> the movie's filled with angry, awkward, and crazy customer reactions. IG, I know you've done a lot of customer-based jobs in your life, but have you ever had a, a crazy customer reaction like they dealt with in the movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing is anytime you are dealing in a customer-driven thing, you're going to have people that just have the craziest either requests or demands of whatever is going on, regardless of whether policies exist or there's other matters, be they safety or something else in mind. I mean, even so much as, you know, just somebody saying, well, why can't I get this for this price? You know, I mean, literally like years ago, I worked at Best Buy. I kind of worked in the computer area because I knew more than most people. So working in the computer department and like one of the big things then, because this was a while ago, was we had a big case full of full of RAM. And people would come up and try and price RAM to put in their computers or to ask why their computer was running slow. And a big common answer then was you need more RAM. You did, most people had maybe four megabytes of RAM or, you know, even less sometimes. It's like, well, if you put more RAM in it, it'll run better. Well, how much is the RAM? And most of the time it'd be about $200 to upgrade. And they're like, well, why, why is it that much? I already spent $1,000 on a computer. Why do I need another $200 in RAM? I'm like, because that's what it costs. Well, can I get it cheaper? I'm like, I doubt it. Not really. I mean, it's wherever you go, it's two hundred dollars. I mean, we're we're right on par with the whole industry, and they just wanted to argue and be like, "Well, can't I just like just do take the old RAM out and bring it back here and give it back to you, and you could sell me new stuff cheaper?" And I'm like, "No, we don't want your old RAM." <laughs> it's they just wouldn't get it, and and it's it's the same way with everything. I mean, you're working somewhere, you're supposed to be the expert, and they want to come in and. Just like in here, do you have any new releases? And they're standing in front of the new releases. Same thing. I mean, it, I, I did work in a video store for a while too, and it was literally just like what uh, Randall was dealing with, where you just had people with inane questions, like, you know, basically asking for movies that just released in theaters or asking for some like strange offbeat thing from the Czech Republic. It was just weird all the time. <laughs> now, what do you, uh, what do you recommend for a 13 year old kid that what's the bed? I had a situation as uh, such I was working working retail and a lady saw another lady that she was in a custody dispute with. I guess it was a step parent and a biological parent. The lady was yelling something back from the lingerie section at uh, this retail store. The lady that was talking to me that I was dealing with at the front desk saw her and made a beeline for her and turned around and started punching her. It was like a battle royal. There was just bra and panties flying everywhere as these two families were fighting in the middle of the store. So I just got on the PA and and kind of started doing a WrestleMania thing with it. I'm like, oh, no, I think she's going to hit her with the rack. Anyway, the cops were called and it was cleaned up. But it was uh, it was a pretty crazy scene. So there's no time for love, Dr. Jones. Ryan, do you think Randall keeps his job at the video store for the free movies or to torture Dante or to fuck with the customers? Uh probably all of the above you know and maybe he doesn't seem to be the most motivated person in the world so maybe that's that's just it you know there's some people who kind of like they're set in certain places in their life and there's zero motivation to advance or move anywhere unless they're forced to so i could see him just kind of hanging out and sitting there until he loses the job or the closes down or something along those lines but he just he he comes across to me as one of those people who just I don't see anything there. He, he kind of like, he's very transparent. Like, you know, everything you need is right there and there's nothing underneath. There's no motivation or drive. It's just to 
to yeah harass Randall and just hang out. It's got to be purely just to mess with customers, though, because obviously it's not the video store because he wants to borrow the car to go to a good video store. So he don't care about paying for rentals. That doesn't bother him. But just imagine, like, your job is to sit somewhere as often as you feel like it, close down when you're when any whim comes across and, and literally just tell people to go fuck themselves all day. That's a pretty good job. Yeah, I agree. And then your best friend is essentially working right next door and you can kind of go over and see him whenever you want. I mean, you can just lock the door and go hang out and, and get free Gatorade. I mean, if finances weren't such a big deal, I, I could see that being the ideal situation for IG and I. IG rumor has it that there's heat between Jeff Anderson, who plays Randall, and Kevin Smith, which has put Clerks 3 on ice. Can they push the franchise forward without the, um, Dante's jaded best friend? Well, after Clerks 2, I think maybe they can. You know, um, what's what's the kid's name, the goofy kid with the pillow pants and everything? You know, they could he could take Randall's spot. And just he, he would then become the Dante, and Dante would become the Randall. So there are options. And, you know, I believe Kevin Smith is smart enough. I mean, he's he's a pretty smart guy, and he writes pretty – pretty well as far as what he's writing when he's allowed to write in his little uh, skewed universe he does really well like when he branches out like cop out i didn't like that all that much he did good with what he was given i don't think he wrote that from completely on his own it was kind of an idea somebody else gave him but when he can stay inside view askew he does really well so i think it's possible or maybe they ought to just kiss and make up and get randall back wearing his uh Rocket Rick shirt and doing the Randall walkout. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. And speaking of him staying within the view ask you genre, he just released a, I believe it was an Instagram post where he said that he's been writing and he may have creative uh, control of the biggest IP of his career and it's big budget. And he may be able to push whatever franchise that is forward. It's probably not Star Wars, DC or Marvel. I can't imagine what it is. If you're a studio, Ryan, are you putting Kevin Smith at the helm of a big budget project? Oh, that's a that's a tough one because he's such a he's so unique in in what he does, and and I think he does in a, in a very narrow range. He does what he does incredibly well, um, but he's such a big fan of of the genre, and he's such a pop culture nerd that you know, in, in some ways. You would be, I would be confident giving him, you know, a property that he was a fan of because I, I don't think, you know, being, I'm a fan of him. I'm a big fan of um, his uh, Fat Man on Batman podcast, and I really enjoy he and um, his co host and, and kind of what they, when they talk about movies and comics. And, you know, I think he's somebody that wouldn't want to get things wrong. So I would kind of trust him in that, you know, I don't think he would he would take like a you know Superman and make it all dick jokes. You know, I think he would actually try to be on it and do you know do right by the property. So, you know, I just don't know that that's what he does well. So I think I'm of two minds. Like I don't think he would do a disservice to the to the property, but I just don't know that it would be the best Kevin Smith you're going to get because I don't know that that's really what he does really well. But then again, he's written some really great comic book runs too. So you know, I'm I'm cha- I'm, I'm thinking this on the fly. I give him the the good uh, property because I think he can do a good job. We got a thumbs up from Ryan. <laughs> He can't be any worse no, than Zack Snyder, right? I mean, he kind of almost tried to destroy yeah, no, Superman, no, so he, he can't he can't he can't do anything worse than he did. I mean, why not give him a big property? Why not let him like bring uh, Green Arrow to the screen? Because that's that's the his biggest thing that he wrote is he wrote a good a big series on Green Arrow. Why not? I mean, he, he's he's talented enough. I mean, to to write the comic stories. He's done some uh, some good directing. Why not? Here's a question for you, for both of you guys, uh, being big Star Wars fans. Would you trust him with the Star Wars movie? No. It depends <laughs> on the movie. <laughs> that was a fast no. <laughs> to me, it depends on the movie. At this point, I can't imagine it being any worse than uh, Ryan Johnson. But that's just me. <laughs> Maybe, well, maybe if they did like a Tales from the Cantina thing, he could do some of that. But, you know, like a, a mainline like saga film, not a chance. No, because they, they, they took their chance taking somebody who's not as rounded and it divided the fan base, which was Ryan Johnson. Was the movie bad? No, but it, it he tried to take a spin on it that didn't need a spin. Like you can just play the formula in Star Wars movies and, and be happy. And he tried to go against the formula and it just pissed half of the population off. I tease Ryan a lot, but I just actually sat down last night and rewatched it. 
I don't dislike the movie. I just, a lot of the choices make me scratch my head and say, why, why, why did we go this route with it? Why did we do it this way? But you know, I'm not a director. I'm a, a movie watcher and it'll probably always stay that way. Ryan clerks was made for less than 28 K per money spent. Could it be the best low budget film of all time? I, I mean, yeah, I guess if you go like pound for pound rankings, it's got to be up there. Because I mean, what what movie? I can't even think of a movie with a, a sm- anywhere near that budget that's been a as good and, and b as successful. Can you guys think of anything? No, uh, it's it's right up there. I mean, there uh, most low budget things like really look low budget, and what he did with this was like use low budget techniques. Like I'm not going to print in color, so I don't have to worry about color correction or matching or any of that stuff and just do it in black and white. And that I'm sure was a big cost saving technique, but it worked like there was no need for this to be in color. So why not just shoot it in black and white, save yourself a a truckload of money and just everything worked. Everything that he did work because it was more a character driven story. It was a small setup that basically he was sneaking in there at night because it was the job he was working at. Why not? I mean, it all worked out really well. I was going to say Blair Witch was as good of creative for the way that it was shot and and the kind of suspenseful ending. But that was 60 K. So, no, I don't think it was anywhere as good as Clerks as far as money spent. IG life is yet a series of down endings. We go into the discussion about the innocent contractors killed on the destruction of the second Death Star. And we've talked about this multiple times, but the first time really on the podcast, did Kevin Smith and Quentin Tarantino in the 90s change the way that dialogue will be written and, and spoke in movies forever? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, they you have to really have... It doesn't always have to be intelligent-based, but it has to be intelligent conversation, right? I mean, it's not really all that intelligent to have a talk about Death Star contractors, right? Because it's not real. But the argument there was real and and very intelligent. And, And both Kevin Smith and Quentin Tarantino are good about taking discussions that just aren't going to be real and making them as real as they can be and being very dialogue driven where it's not about the effects. It's not about the 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 shot set up and how good it looks. It's really about how the characters develop. And that's a, a thing that had been gotten away from very highly at that point. And still, even to this day, like, you know, a lot of action movies, you don't have any character development. You've got, you're just going to run action. So you don't know anything about the character. It's just fun to watch them blow shit up. Well, Ryan, we take the cool snappy dialogue and the cool character writing of Quentin Tarantino and Kevin Smith away from clerks or even reservoir dogs do we end up with just basic student films at that point? Uh, yeah, I think they're, they're in the large part. That's that's what's made both of their careers. I think when we think of even you know either director, we don't think of you know so much of like cinematography. You don't think so much of mood, or you know, we really think of you know the dialogue is the you know the first thing that comes to mind. And and uh, I think either one of them, if you take you take that away, you you take away a large part of of what makes them. You know, good director. Even like, I mean, a good example is, um, you know, Kevin Smith directs has been directing some of like the Arrowverse shows. So he's been doing Flash and Supergirl, and his Flash and Supergirl shows are, are perfectly adequate, but they don't really stand out from any of the other episodes because they're not written by him. And he's you know perfectly fine director. And I know there are little elements here and there where you get a little you know a little touch up on the dialogue where you know you 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 know that it's a little bit of a hint of Kevin Smith. But I think that we. You know him and his element is writing and and writing dialogue um, and that that really resonates with us and I think our generation and uh, yeah so I think you really he needs the dialogue to really make the most of, of, of what he you know what he can do. Ig Jedi or Empire and why? Oh, it's got to be Empire because of the lack of Ewoks. Why not? We can go with that for an answer, right? No, I just I just like the turn in Empire. You know, I mean it. it I remember being a kid and seeing it and not even expecting the I am your father line to come out. And that just kind of blew my whole kid mind away. And I still anticipate it coming anytime I'm watching Empire. It's just the reaction is poor and really poorly driven. And I'm I'm glad that they took Luke Snow and made Vader do it in uh, Revenge of the Sith. And it, it's just as corny and bad, but it's... It's still fun, and I I like the movie. I mean, the thing is, they're pretty close together for me, like Empire and Jedi, but I still prefer Empire. How about you, Ryan? 
Oh, definitely The Last Jedi. <laughs> Not The Last Jedi. No, Return of the Jedi. I'm messing with you. <laughs> Wait for me. You son of a... Oh. <laughs> So, uh, Empire. I mean, mostly the, you know the reasons Ig said. I, I think it it, it is uh, it's it stands alone. Again, we're 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 all big Star Wars fans, and I think we put Star Wars ahead of anything for many reasons for this wonder and nostalgia. But I think uh, of all the movies, um, I think Empire and The Last Jedi are the only great films among those movies and again i love all of them but if, if we're saying like what's a great film i think those are the two and and so empire you know it just has so many amazing elements um from you know the twist and just the drama and i just uh, yeah i love that movie so i would definitely but definitely empire i think um jedi is great uh, and it's a fun movie and it's a great way to cap it but it's kind of like the dark knight you know where the dark knight rises no matter how good that movie was it was never going to be as good as the dark knight and i think you have the same thing with Jedi. Like no matter how good that movie was going to be, in which the Ewoks definitely brought it down a notch or two, um, it, you know, wasn't going to be as good as Empire. I love the beginning of Return of the Jedi. I mean, there's nothing better than that time at uh, Jabba's palace and uh, the Sarlacc pit. Empire to me will always hold a special place because when I saw it, I was really young and I had never seen a movie before where the bad guy definitively win. And that was as close as I would ever get. And because of that movie, it, it's always been a thing for me to to want a strong bad guy, to want not just a challenge for the protagonist in the story, but I, I want it to feel real. And one of the things I like about the new Marvel movies is that you can actually identify with the antagonist of the story. It's not just some, I'm going to take over the world type of scheme, but it's real heartache, it's real pain, and, and you actually almost root for them a little bit. And I, I don't think it's necessarily a terrible thing to root for the bad guy in the movie sometimes. Ryan, Veronica is basically an all-around good girlfriend and wants Dante to better himself, makes some lasagna. I think she, I even saw her change his tire once, but he can't seem to shake Caitlin, who's a terrible match for him and did nothing but cheat on him like seven and a half times. Have you ever been in a Caitlin versus Veronica situation and which one did you choose? Uh, no, I've been kind of more serial monogamist, I guess. So I've never been in a situation where I had to really choose between two people where you know where one was was the right choice but i just couldn't shake the other and I, so i've been pretty lucky in that way that i've, I've never really had a situation like that he's boring as fuck ig have you ever been in a <laughs> situation where it was a choice between your heart and what's in your pants oh yeah yeah i have i mean i was much younger and it's you know i, I it's not anything recent but yeah i mean i had some times where you know the the options were kind of open to me. And I had, you know, one girl really, really just kind of went out of her way to treat me nice and do things for me and try and spend time with me. And then this other girl who was literally just marginally better looking and that's about it, but like literally had much less going for her, like wasn't working, didn't have anything going on, you know, just family was fucking weird. And I ended up throwing away the good one that was great and nice to me and was moving forward in the world for the one that just treated me like shit at every single turn. Yeah. It bites you in the ass something fierce. Cause uh, that's, that would be my first ex-wife. So yeah, that that's bad. And you know, you'd think somebody would learn, but I do have two ex-wives. So yeah. I mean, it's human nature to want probably what's not best for you and not see conventionally that you have something great right in front of you and you see it time and time again you, you always see the the guy end up with the wrong girl or the girl end up with the the guy that beats her and takes her money and the head and the heart are always in conflict with each other when it comes to relationships and when you can't determine which one should weigh out it's always going to make a mess especially when you want to stand on the fence so you almost have to definitively choose a side and then kind of stick with that choice. If you try to play both sides, it's never going to work out well. One of the biggest gags in the movie, Ryan, and you're a super nice guy, but was Dante and Randall going to Dante's ex-girlfriend's wake. Now, having sex with someone, does that automatically obligate you to have to go to their funeral in case that they die? Uh, no, I would hope not. <laughs> Please, no. Please let the answer be no. <laughs> <laughs> and my follow-up question, Ryan, is would knocking a body out of a casket be a deal breaker for you as a friend? I mean, would you be done hanging out with that person? <laughs> if, 
if I if I take the blame for it, yeah, kind of. Like, it kind of sucks. I just wish we got to see the scene. You know, clearly I understand for budget reasons why we didn't. But uh, you know, it's one of those things which would have been amazing to to see it play out. But uh, but yeah, no, that, that's a that's a bit of a a, a deal breaker in a friendship. How about you, Ig? Would you be obligated to go to one of the girls that kindly enough to sleep with you funeral? And if I knock the body out of the casket, would we be done being podcast partners? Oh, well, uh, now it all depends on how recently I guess I had slept with her. Maybe maybe that's something. <clears throat> if it's like, you know, more than two years ago, then no, I think I've reached the statute of limitations. I don't have to do anything. Um, maybe it also depends on how, like, crazy the breakup was. If it was a bad breakup, maybe that shortened the time span. But um Really, the knocking her out of the casket would really all depend on, you know, everything that led up to that. Because quite honestly, if it was still funny, I mean, we could still be friends. <laughs> knocking a body out of a casket is always funny. It's it's not like it's my mother. I mean, that might that might do something different. But, you know, a girl that I banged once. Yeah, we could do that. That leads me to think about these wake or funeral selfies. What is missing in you as a human being that you think that this is the perfect time? I've got to capture this moment, especially open casket wakes that I'm like, yeah, taking you in the dead. Just yeah, click, yeah click. like I want to remember my grandfather. It's like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? What's missing? Do yes, people actually do that? Yes. yes. I, that's insane. I've seen literally hundreds of pictures of people doing that. It is insane. I don't know what's wrong with people about it. And so, and like, it's mostly girls. And for whatever reason, half of them are wearing like low cut tops. So their boobs are hanging out and everything. And they're making sure it's kind of doing that Instagram kind of glamorous look and everything. And there's grandma over the shoulder in the casket. What's, what That's are you awful. doing? Yeah, it's completely awful. On the other hand, from this side, it's kind of like the people of walmart.com. It's like watching that yeah. whole debacle happen. It's entertaining in its horrificness. Well, I don't believe in ghosts or anything, but I, I hope that they come back and haunt them if they do shit like that. I, th that creeps me out as bad as somebody who takes pictures of somebody that's actively dying. Like, oh, you know, Uncle Jim's on his last legs. Yeah, and the positions were reversed. Would you want Uncle Jim taking pictures of you, you creep? Have a little bit of humanity. It seems to be all lost on people. Ryan, Randall has a coming to Jesus meeting with Veronica and tells her that Dante is in love with Caitlin. Was he being a well-meaning friend or did he break the infamous bro code? A little bit of both. You know, I think he was being a well-meaning friend and I think he, he, he thought he was doing doing him a favor by, by kind of taking, you know, the, the burden away. But, you know, it does to, to a large extent that you, know, that, that you need to be 100% sure that your friend wants you to do that before you do something like that. Because that really is, you, you just don't know with relationships what's going to go on, what's going on in their mind, if they're going to change their mind. And so that's a, like, you don't do that to your friend unless you know, unless you know they want you to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really hanging it out there. I'm, it's one thing to try to help, like have a conversation. I've been in positions where I've actually kind of helped or saved relationships by smoothing it over by being close with both participants. But to end a relationship for somebody else, I don't think I, I would ever be that well-meaning or, you know, dance on the bro code that hard. You're just asking for it. It's it's sort of like that situation where two people who make up and break up every day and then you start bad-mouthing the person that they just broke up with, knowing that they're going to get back together, you're always going to look like an asshole and lose. Bro code is real, my friend. You know, he was completely against the bro code. Doesn't matter if you're trying to do good or not. You don't step into the relationship that way. Like, you can talk all the shit you want to your bro, but you don't say it to his girl. The bro code is real. Absolutely. In the end, IG, Caitlin's catatonic after screwing a dead guy and Veronica dumps Dante and he realizes he's made a huge mistake. Your thoughts on Clerks and your final rating. I love Clerks. You know, I mean, from the first time I saw it until like I watched it last week, every single time I, I come away just happy that I watched it. I mean, it, it I can run a lot of different emotions through that movie and it, and some of it's nostalgia and some of it's just because it's really well written. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a noir film. It's almost a black comedy, but it's a, it's just something that you got to watch. And especially if you've ever worked retail or in video stores, which that's starting to become a thing of the past because it's been so long since blockbuster really existed prominently. But any, any time you've, really dealt with the human population, especially at, at, in a retail level, this really starts to speak to you. And and it spoke to me because I've lived that life. And it still rings true, even though I'm completely out of retail, just 
even dealing with other employees at, at my workplace. I, I really enjoy it. And I think everybody else that I that I'm good friends with does too. And maybe that's because we're all of like mind. Kevin Smith is amazing. And even as Silent Bob with his one line, I, you know, she brings you lasagna. How can you not love that? I guess I, I believe that, you know, if, if you like lasagna and you like black and white movies and really like comedy, you go go watch this and go berserker for it. I give it a nine. I never worked in you know in retail in that type of setting, but you can really get a feel for just how honest and real the movie is. You can tell that it was a real lived experience, and uh, you know that's something I always love about you know really a, a movie like that or any anything where you can get you tell that the the perspective that is being written directed from it is real and, and they really get it, and you can feel that even though I've never been in that setting. Um, I think. It's one of those movies that's infinitely rewatchable. It's it's hysterical, um, and it's so real and down to earth that that it, you know it's hard to. I don't know how you can not like it. Um, I also think it's it, it's pretty progressive for its time when you consider some the variety of topics that, that that come up and kind of the perspective. You really tell that I think Kevin Smith was a little bit ahead of um, his time in, in writing that. And while you know a lot of the humor in some ways is sophomoric, it, in other ways it was really really smart and insightful. So. Um, you know, I really enjoy it again. I enjoy it every time I watch it, and I think um, you know it's interesting because watching it when I, when it came out when I was I was very young, it was hilarious to me then, but I didn't get most of it. And then watching it, you know, thirty what thirty years later, ninety four oh four or fourteen, or like twenty five years later, um, it's it's still just as funny, but for different reasons. So I really. Yeah, really enjoy it. I give it a nine as well. I like Ryan doing math. <laughs> yeah, he was quick at it. I mean, at least he didn't have to take his top off or shoes or anything. All right. Firstly, I want to thank the first lady of Clerkdom, Ms. Marilyn Gigliotti, for the interview. That being said, Clerks will forever be on my Mount Rushmore of comedies. I love Dante, and I see so much of my personality, uh, my own personality in Randall. They're some of my favorite characters written of all time. I mean, it's one of the most quotable movies of all time, and this movie was a complete game changer as far as dialogue goes and it ushered in the era of it's cool to be a geek and push writers to be write cooler edgier dialogue it also launched kevin smith's career probably nerdist probably twitch probably chris hardwig made comic-con a thing i mean i could go on forever but you get my point clerks is an amazing movie if you haven't seen it you should i give it a nine and that's it for this episode of the Cynic Radio Podcast. I'm Edgar He. We had a great time bringing you this week's show. Please send all your comments, questions, concerns, and any crazy news stories from your neck of the woods to cynicradio at gmail.com. Find us on the internet at cynicradio.com. Look for us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cynicradio. And find us on Twitter at cynicradio. Continue to like, listen, subscribe, and share this with all your friends and family. And until next time... Don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at cynicradio.com. Available for download on iTunes. 